we uh, had a very powerful testimony from our sister, uh, Mrs. Allen Kajina. And uh, I thought it was important for us to especially digest what she shared and how it applies in your life. We don't just want to come and talk and fill our mind with so many uh, things, but uh, what we want is to hear, but also to do. We don't want to be here as only, we also want to be doers. So I wanted us to spend uh, some minutes to uh, take a kind of stock on what she shared so that it may help us to apply it. For many of you who are new entrants in this area of transforming uh, society, transforming your agency, transforming your department, transforming your constituency, transforming everywhere God has called you, you have a responsibility. So I've picked a few points that I want to start with, and then I'll give you a few minutes to comment. And uh, yesterday, I also asked you to send in your comments, uh, which you did. Thank you very much. All of you did. And I've summarized them here in five key points or five categories, which I'm going to summarize. And I'll give you a few minutes to, for, for, to, to get your input, further input. And in case uh, uh, Sister Allen would want to uh, comment on any of those which was raised or in case of any questions. We'll give a few people to ask any questions so that then this will be interactive uh, to help us to apply some of these principles, especially those who are starting in this field. Uh, one of the highlights in, in Alani's sharing was the fact that she determined uh, from the outset, together with a few of her colleagues, to not allow things to go wrong when they're watching. I think this is a very, very important point because many Christians, uh, many times when God has called us in the positions of authority or responsibility or in offices, we sometimes tend to avoid uh, annoying people. We play safe. You don't want to soil your hands. You know, if you get too into these battles, your reputation, so sometimes we end up compromising. And this is a very, very big temptation. And that is one of the major areas why Christians don't uh, transform. Because we want to play safe. As long as I have my salary, I get my allowances, I'm not uh, stepping on anybody's feet. Uh, let me just leave. After all, everybody knows this. And when things get worse, uh, corruption, what? Uh, let me look for greener pasture somewhere in another Christian organization like uh, World Vision where there's not this level of corruption. Let me go to another organization like Co Compassion because here it is too dark, here it's too bad. Why do we have darkness? The definition of darkness is absence of light. If you run away, who will bring light there? This is a major issue for us to discuss as Christians because world over, majority of Christians always want to run away, always want to look for a better place or look for a Christian organization or a clean organization. We've not been called to go to clean organizations only. We've been called to take light into darkness. This is a big, big paradigm shift. Don't play safe. If you don't want to annoy people, you never transform. Sometimes you have to make a stand. Daniel did that and it cost them. Daniel Shadrach, Messiah, and Abednego. Everybody who made a stand uh, in the Bible had that challenge. Joseph had these challenges when they made that stand. So uh, also, um, Alan shared about how a brother, uh, Brother James shared and said, be the burden bearer of your A. Pray until some things uh, change. Uh, then uh, uh, they had this whole long prayer uh, session. Uh, no, before she became uh, the, exec the, what, the commissioner general, they had to pray outside. They had to meet somewhere outside. I, I especially liked that. They realized we may not be able to meet here where we are, but the few of us who are committed to changing URA, we must start an altar of prayer and that altar continued for 
a period of two years, two years praying. This is what other people don't do. Six months, three months, you pray and you don't see anything, you give up. And as you had, they, sometimes they remained very few, but still continued. This is how you transform. You have to maintain an altar according to Leviticus chapter six, that altar should kept, be kept burning, but you have to be ready to remain a few of you who are totally determined and committed to transformation. Sister Mole Asimwe, honorable, read a, a passage this morning in Isaiah 62 where it says, you know, uh, your, your, ch your children will marry you. Marry, marriage is a commitment. You marry that organization, you marry that institution, you say, I am married to this institution. I'm determined to have it transform or change, and I'm not going to give up. I'll give my all, my time. I will sacrifice for what it takes. That is how people transform. If you don't, you're not ready to do that, you cannot transform. You just live there, you'll be mediocre, you maybe not annoy anybody, but you never, you maybe you'll annoy the, your Lord Jesus Christ who appointed you there and 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 the that is a big issue. I wanted also to highlight something that Alan didn't mention, but I thought it's important to be mentioned. And uh, allow me, Alan, I, I didn't ask her for permission, uh, but I think Paul is also here. Paul, uh, Alan's husband, was a big, has been a big, big, big support in all this. Uh, when they were still living uh, in Mango somewhere, I used to go and join him when we were praying for Alan. When Alan was going through any tough times, she was not shy to call for support for prayer and she would always call and say you know uh, she used to call me uh, brother joshua i'm really here i need your support now there is this challenge constantly she had been like that all these years she's, she's I, I really like that because she always opened the shares uh, challenges and said now we're going through this and i remember times when i would go uh, to their home and we just spend time of prayer i liked especially the fact that Paul was very, very committed to see Alan succeed and uh, maintain that uh, Sunday prayer uh, altar in the afternoon in their house. Uh, other people would come in and pray with them. And uh, this, this has been on for many, many years. So in other words, he provided the support in prayer, but also the spiritual covering. Many of you are ladies, are sisters in the Lord. You really need the support of your husband in any venture, any attacks that you're going to, to, to face. The covering of your uh, husband will be very, very important. When you are spiritually covered, uh, you go with that uh, sense of affirmation and the protection that God gives. You know, in the Bible, when you look at Ephesians, any prayer, uh, in a spiritual warfare, you have to be under authority. Uh, you may not have noticed this, but let me mention it in passing. You can go back and look at it. In the book of uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, verse 10 says, um, maybe let me read that because uh, for some of you may not have time. Let me quickly go through it because of uh, its importance. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10 says, be strong in the Lord. Finally, I want you to notice the, the, that part which says, finally. Finally uh, comes in last. You know, finally, every time you say finally, you're about to end. So to, to understand what Paul is saying here, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now put on the whole armor. Why, why is he saying finally? You have to go back to chapter 5. In chapter five, you remember these verses were not, Paul did not put in these chapters and verses. He just wrote a letter to his uh, brethren, the church in Ephesus, and uh, he didn't put these chapters and verses. So it's a long letter. Uh, Bishop Langton Stephen put in these verses in 1200 AD. Now in verse, in verse uh, why he says finally, he starts this whole uh, discussion in, Chapter 5, uh, verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dispersion, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice there is a comma after the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Then now he explains what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. He specifically mentioned the three things. One, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, in verse 19, you, you start to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That is one. When people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they speak, they sing, they praise, they worship. Number Verse 20, they start giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving is part of and part and parcel of being with, filled with the Holy Spirit. The way you tell that people are not filled with the Holy Spirit, they're always grumbling, complaining, they're negative in their speech. That is one area you can always tell the person who is not filled with the Holy Spirit. When they're filled with the Holy Spirit, another thing that always comes is that they're quick to forgive they are quick to forgive, very key, quick to forgive, but they are also always filled with giving of thanks. Now, the, the third point of, of after being filled with the Holy Spirit is submitting to one another in the fear of God. So notice speaking, uh, thanksgiving, and then submitting. Now he goes in a long uh, you know, uh, passage of explaining or what submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord would mean. So he says, okay, submitting to one another, wives submit to your husbands. Then he says, okay, you husbands also do A, B, C, D. Uh, then uh, he says, verse 25, husband love your wives. 26, that he might, tell, he explained about the church. Now he goes from the, 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 the husband and wife, then he goes to children. Remember there are no chapters and there are no verses, he's just writing, children obey your parents. He's explaining submission, submitting one to one, uh, uh, submitting one to the other. Uh, women do this, uh, uh, children do this, uh, not women, wives. Wives submit, children submit. Uh, then he explains the fathers what they should do. Then he talks about servants, servants to your bosses, eh? not I service. Then you continue, as you continue down, he, he comes to finally, my brethren. That's the point I'm bringing out. He's showing that in order for you to do spiritual warfare, you, know, you need that submissive attitude. After wives have submitted, children have submitted, uh, workers have submitted, members of uh, church have submitted to their pastors, uh, you know, citizens have submitted to their political leaders, MPs, and all. After that submission, you can now engage the devil. That's a very important principle for you who are going and determined to submit. You must have a submissive attitude. You must be ready to uh, stand below or under God's uh, delegated authority in your life in order to succeed in your endeavor to transform that organization, that entity, whatever God has called you to. You must be ready to see that as a very, very important aspect of your calling. And uh, I thought I should mention that because otherwise you cannot uh, uh, transform. Okay, let me pick out another point here. Uh, number three, when opposition intensifies, uh, that just shows really that deliverance is around the corner. As the opposition intensifies, you know that you've touched the devil where it hurts. You'll find that in the life of Moses, uh, when, when God was talking about uh, the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt, the Bible says when the time of their deliverance was about, let me also read that in Acts, Acts chapter 7, uh, Acts chapter 7, uh, our brother Stephen is making a comment uh, about uh, how the children of Israel were delivered and what happened. Uh, I'm reading Acts chapter 7, verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had shown to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Notice that the time for their exit had arrived. Then another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people, oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. This is the time when Moses was born to bring about the deliverance. Well, the point I'm bringing out is that it's at the time when the deliverance has come that you'll find intensity of opposition. This is where many 
Christians give up, when many Christians walk out, when many Christians throw in the towel, that kind of thing. And I, I, I remember in many of our leadership renewal retreats, which we have had with the marketplace leaders, you find so many of them contemplating, uh, uh, resigning, going for greener pastures, uh, going to another country. This, this is a major, major, major challenge that we need to address among us, to know that God has called us as Christians not to run away from the devil, but to be ready to fight on. And remember, it's when you're about to break through that the devil's attack will intensify. Another passage of scripture you need to see is in Exodus, when the, the children of Israel were about to get out. God has given clear instructions to Moses, and he has told him what to do, but the battle became so uh, uh, intense that he almost gave up. Exodus chapter 5, verse 21. I want you to look at it. Uh, uh, Moses has obeyed, to, uh, obeyed the Lord. He has gone and spoken to um, Pharaoh that you must let the children of Israel go. And then the Pharaoh said, oh, you want them to go? That means they're idle. So he told the taskmasters, don't give them straw, let them make bricks without straw. And then increase, don't, don't decrease the quota that they have to produce every day. The pressure became intense. The people were, the, the, the Hebrew leaders went to Pharaoh and said, why are you doing this to us? They're not giving us straw and yet they are demanding that we produce the same number of bricks. Pharaoh said, because you're idle, your colleagues were here saying they should go and worship. That means you have so, pl so much plenty of time to waste. Uh, so I've uh, now told them not to give you straw. When they came out, Moses uh, and Aaron were just waiting and stood outside to hear what Pharaoh had said. Uh, verse 20 said, then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hands to kill us. You know, you can imagine these are the people Moses has come to deliver. They have all turned against him because he has caused so much pain for them. They don't realize that now the process of deliverance has started. And as it starts, fire is going to increase. There's going to be so much pressure. Verse 22, so Moses returned to the Lord and said, now many of us don't return to the Lord in such times. We start to apportion blame. It is you who did this. I remember Paul and Silas in Philippi, when they were beaten up, they could have spent the whole night complaining. It is you, I told you, you shouldn't cross. I am not even sure that vision of the Macedonian person was from the Lord. People spent so much time in complaining when they should have gone to the Lord in prayer. During those times of, 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 of attack, of intensity, of opposition. Eh? Now, Lord, why have you brought trouble on these people? Why is it that you have sent me? Verse 23, for since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to these people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. We sometimes think just because God has talked to you, has talked to you, things will be easy. No, it isn't necessarily. Sometimes it may be easy, other times it may become tougher. It may become very hot. You may even contemplate living. Your life may be in danger. They may even want to kill you because the wicked and the corrupt are very networked. They are syndicated. You start to fight them here, you'll find where you think you are going to run to get support. They are their good fathers. So you have to be very determined and have your trust total and completely in the Lord. That's why you have to be intimate with the Lord. That's why you have to, to constantly be on your knees. That's why you need a team to pray with. You can't be alone. That's why you continually have to depend on others and the church. Then the Lord said to Moses, chapter 6, verse 1, I want you to listen to this. Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. Uh, now, when God is telling you and sending you in the first place, he never tells you the hardships you go through. It's very interesting. He always tells you the end. So God had told Moses what would happen, but he didn't tell him that this is what will be included. He may summarize it in a mitwejebikule but he never gives you 
Gaganumbuju. He always gives you uh, the, the final product. This is what you, he calls you, you'll be this. And when you start to move in this new organization, the word he has given you, you start to find out the things look very opposite from what he's told you. No, it's, it's not opposite. It's actually, you're going to achieve it, but it is going to cost you. And, and in a, a chapter uh, three, I mean, chapter six, verse three, uh, he tells him something. I ap appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, Lord, I was not known to them. Let me put it in Amplified for you to appreciate it better. Uh, verse three says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. In other words, I revealed my name, El Shaddai, El Shaddai. But my name, Jehovah, the Lord, the redemptive name of God, I did not make myself known to them in acts of great miracles. So in every uh, state, there is a, a revelation of God that you get. God will reveal himself to you as you start to move into this battle. He will bring different aspects of his nature. It is this opposition that reveals to us God. Knowing him is eternal life. Knowing God is eternal life, John 17, verse 3. But he reveals himself through these battles, through these uh, fiery trials. Believe you me, when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego talked to, 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 to Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we will not worship your God. Our God will deliver us. But even if he does not deliver us, we will not worship your God. They were thrown into fire. And that's when the Lord revealed himself in a new light. Jesus himself came and joined them in the fire. And the, he, Nebuchadnezzar saw so four people walking in the fire. There is a revelation that you always get when you're going through fire, a revelation of God. You see God in a new light. There is a name that he reveals. If it is sickness, he reveals himself as Jehovah Rapha. If it is this battle, Jehovah Nisi as your banner. So many of God's revelation to us come during those times. If you persevere and continue, you get the full revelation of God. If you run away, you've short circuited the progression that God has intended for you, the good works that God has ordained beforehand that you should walk in them. They are part and parcel of the plan of God for your life. So that is another uh, thing that I felt uh, I should share. And I, I really want us to look at it from that angle that there is always an intensity. And when you have done your part courageously, uh, you persevere, God told Joshua, stand strong. Joshua, don't fear. That means Joshua was afraid. There is always courage. Courage is not necessary to, to deal with fear. Okay, you, once you trust God, then you will handle the opposition. I liked what uh, our brother, Honorable Ryomoki mentioned. He said, during that time, I was among those who uh, started to rise up against Allen uh, with the workers. But the moment I started and prayed, the Lord told, told me, uh, stop opposing your sister. <laughs> so God handled that from the other side. That is the good thing with God, that when we have people uh, who hear God uh, from every angle, think about him, he's for him, he's for the workers. He's an MP for workers, and many workers are being laid off in URA, and he feels he has to stand for these workers who have to be, uh, you know, to be laid off. And then the Lord cautioned him, and don't, don't dare, uh, don't dare, that is my work. That's the good thing when we work with God. Yeah, so, so other times, you know, you, when pressure is on, people start to tell you, get out of this mess. Don't soil your hands, save yourself. You, you had that, how so many people will always come in to, to tell you, that they love you, definitely, they are not bad people, they wish you well. But many times you'll be careful which, which uh, voices to listen to. Be careful that you're not, even with the people who love you. When Jesus said, I'm going to the cross, Peter, who loved Jesus very much, said, you shouldn't go to the cross. You cannot confess like that, not Jesus. You can't. How can you say you are going to die? You, you, Jesus, don't you know how to confess faith? I don't believe in defeat. You, you should do have faith. <laughs> that was Peter. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. He noticed that this wasn't the voice of God. This was the voice of the devil 
uh, coming through the very person who loves him most. So you be careful with such people. They may even be your relatives, maybe your friends, maybe your, you know, your, your, your most close, closest people who love you. That's why you have to be very intimate with God in these battles, in this calling, because only then can you distinguish between which is the voice of God, which is the voice of the devil. A few moments earlier, when Jesus asked, who do people call me? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, good, that is the father who has just revealed that to you. Jesus was able to tell when the father is speaking through Peter, and he was able to tell when it was the devil speaking through Peter. You must be able to distinguish that. Who, who is speaking through Peter now? Who is speaking through Peter when Peter is coming in to say you shouldn't go to the cross? That was the devil. So be careful. The voices, the people who speak, uh, that takes intimacy with God. Number four, uh, Alan constantly sought uh, pastors for firepower and other Christians and other friends and other believers, you know, almost got offended when they refused. And that offense always comes when you expect people to understand you and they don't. That is a big issue. Sometimes you can get offended. I was sharing with the members of parliament who did not get through, who those who are aspiring to be members of parliament. And I, I could find how much offense many had taken. Uh, we didn't get through the, the I mean, the, the, the pain and the, you can understand, but you know, it's always very easy to say to so-and-so who didn't help me, I expected a Christian to contribute. Don't be offended with the people because they are not the ones who called you. They may not understand what you understand. They may not see what you see. They may not have the burden you have. You've prayed for this for a long time and you have had God deal with you in your heart. They haven't. Maybe they are busy on the other areas God has called them. So don't ever be offended with God. There was a time when John the Baptist was offended by Jesus. Why, why hasn't he got me out of this prison? I'm here. Language, it was so much heat. He was uh, alone. And Jesus seemed to continue uh, without anything. He didn't even send a WhatsApp a message or text message to uh, John the Baptist. And he, he got offended. Jesus said, blessed is you, please not offended in me. He sent a message. Uh, to, to Jesus, are you really the one or we should wait for another? So don't be offended. Uh, be aware that people sometimes may not see what you see, and uh, but God will still bring help from other source. And that's why it's important for us as pastors, as the pulpit ministers, our work is to support you. And I want to, to, to repent on behalf of other pastors and leaders that for a long time we have not really appreciated the role you are playing in national transformation. We have instead seen you as channels of getting our ministry, ministries uh, uh, financed. When we hear somebody promoted or become a member of parliament, oh, that is a member of my church, now we we'll get more money. The, the attention has been more on what you, you contribute uh, financially to the man of God or to, the, to my ministry. This is a very, very bad and wrong attitude that we have had as pastors, and I ask you to forgive us. That's why we, we really have this altar and these retreats that we have been uh, doing for about eight years now to just uh, give you opportunities where you can come and share, where you can have a shoulder to cry on, where we have a support. Our pastor Deo here, uh, Betty, Andrew Bakainaga, and many, uh, and Dr. Kansime, uh, Jane Cheng and a few others, we've been organizing these retreats with Bishop Polombi and Mama Maria to just provide opportunity where uh, you Christian leaders in the marketplace can have a, a time where you come share uh, testimonies, borrow a reef from who, what so and so has done, uh, so that we can really support you because you are not just here to support our ministries, you as a ministries. We have pulpits ministers, we have prophets in the church and prophets in the marketplace. We have apostles in the church and apostles in the marketplace. You have as much calling before God as we do. And so that is something that I needed to, to emphasize. But also, I wanted to appreciate our sister that she maintained the heart of humility before God and his people. Where you maintain a heart of humility, people can bring in, I mean, the good people the right people, the right-hearted people. 
where you always seek help and say, please come and pray with me. Uh, you see yourself as part of the big team. When you, you think, oh, this is my thing, this is, um, you, you, you don't bring in others for, 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 for support, for prayer, but it's all about me, me, me. When you, you bring in other people, they feel they're part of your success. They start to pray for your success because they feel you've involved them. And Alan, we want to thank you so much for that. Accepting help from others. When James comes and says, be burden bearer, pray until things change. And then you invited Jackson, come and the, yeah, we need that prayer school that you mentioned. He led the school, you called your team, they prayed. I remember in particular, when Alan was going through a very difficult time, similar to what she, she has been mentioning. And uh, you know, she would do a few times, once in a while she calls me when those things are very, very tough. And I, I remember what she shared, I was in Indege, uh, with meeting with other pastors who had a general assembly and I said, Alan, I'm, I'm now in Indonesia, I'm a little bit far, uh, but we need maybe to pray. Can, can you come and we pray from here? And she, you know, she came the next day, next morning. She came, we had a, this general assembly of pastors where we were there for a few days. And I said, I can't come to the city, but she drove all the way to Indonesia University and we prayed for her. Uh, there are others also like uh, Justice Catherine Bamgamerevi, uh, and they, she also came and we, we prayed. But she she came and she was really really bad and, and about this very serious uh, uh, challenge that she was facing. And uh, after that prayer, when the church we prayed as church at the body of Christ, uh, she recognized that if I need if the, really the church prayed for me here, I think I will get a breakthrough. And sure enough, that evening, you know, uh, she called and sent a message saying, you know what, God has worked. The very, very challenge that we prayed for, God has answered. It was so immediate. It was just a few hours. And I realized why many uh, other Christians sometimes fail, because they don't recognize the authority that the body of Christ has to change things. When you have the whole body of Christ standing behind you, they may not have the knowledge you have. They may not have the information you have, but if you are humble enough to seek their help, you have no idea what the church can do. Far more than what you, um, this, this, this general assembly you had all pastors and leaders from all over the country and that prayer changed things in the spirit room. And from that moment, there was a change. And I was so happy when you know she sent me a message and said, God has done it. What a miracle. And I, I rejoiced in my spirit, I remember one time, uh, some time back, I was going through so much battles uh, in Old Kampala where I have a building. This building had been occupied by the army and a lot of bloodshed had been shed during Idi Amin and Obote too. And when I entered this building, every night I was under so much attack. For months, I could not sleep. I went in prayer, I went in fasting, I did everything that I knew how to do. I quoted scripture nothing was changing. I could not get peace. I was under so much oppression. I was oppressed. I would go out. I remember going to Kako for a whole week and praying and fasting and nothing changed. But then one morning I attended our usual prayer meeting. Uh, this was in the in early 2000. Uh, I attended our prayer meeting in the morning at 5 a.m. And we had a few young girls and boys who were about, they were about six or seven. Uh, our usual 5 a.m. to seven in the morning, we have had this order for, me, for many years. So I, I, I just mentioned it simply. I said, you people need to pray for me because I'm going through this and this. And uh, maybe let me kneel down and you pray for me. They surrounded me. I mean, the prayers they prayed, they are they just young believers. They are newly born again. They, I, I had them just shouting, one is shouting this, another one. They prayed and believe me from that moment, I never had any attack. I had so much peace, I had a breakthrough. I would sleep freely. I was shocked. For months, I, I wondered how could these new believers have so much authority and be able to do what I could not do as an individual. It taught me how to learn to depend on the church, 
what power the church has. The, power has, the church has so much power that when you learn to take use of this, you'll be amazed what you can accomplish in your particular calling. Then the teamwork, you know, understanding that we work together as a team. Number five, uh, prayer walks, prayer action, and understanding that thrones are empowered by altars. Okay? You, you, every office, every position that you have is empowered by altar. This is a principle, both in the kingdom of Satan and in the kingdom of God. The people who sacrifice to demons have so much power. It's very hard to move them because they have invoked spiritual power. Spiritual power uh, and the natural authority go together. If you want to become a member of parliament in the world, you go and sacrifice dogs or cats or uh, cows. Or, you know, that's what they do. They go and sacrifice when they are going for uh, to stand, when they are going for elections. For us, what do we do? Do we pray? Do we uh, also have a prayer altar? That's how you get your power. Yours is not from Satan, not from shedding people's blood or animal blood. Yours is prayer and fasting with uh, others. And then you release supernatural power. So then the other is spiritual sensitivity. You noted that there were dreams and the vision that God would give constantly, constantly, constantly. Uh, a plant just outside the uh, Commissioner General's office, yeah? just before she became uh, Commissioner General, they noticed this, this plant. You see, the people, the wicked people, people who don't believe in God, they have pl placed some things in the offices. It may be an artifice, it may be something you got from China, it will be... And you never know that that's where they have their power, holding the whole office, the whole organization. The whole department is held just because somebody bought something, some idol which has brought in, and it's causing so much power. When they poured anointing oil uh, on that plant, it dried. This is where you are going, many of you who are starting in this office, you are going in to face some of these things. You, it, it requires sensitivity. It requires the leading of the Holy Spirit to deal with gatekeepers, spirits, demons that are gatekeepers in some organization, and you cannot have breakthrough until you deal with them. A stone, just uh, holding the door. Can you imagine that simple? And then uh, she didn't mention something, but she, I know it's, you know, she has shared it before, when God gave her a promise in Genesis 41, 49, that you collect so much, uh, 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 Joseph collected so much grain that they could no longer count. And when God gives you a promise and you constantly quote it, you release the supernatural power. That is where the spiritual part comes in to your natural uh, delivery. For you to deliver, you need a word from the Lord. You need a promise from the Lord on which you can hold. Okay? Mama Janet always likes that song which says, I'm standing on the promises of God. The promises of God are the ways that God comes in when you are stuck, when you are finished, you have something to uh, run back to. You say, Lord, but you sent me. Lord, but you said this. And because he's a God of covenant, he will always uh, hold on to his word. He'll make sure he fulfills his word. If you can go back to that word, which he has given you, it will be very, very important in hard times. When you're about to be discouraged, run back to the, it's a fallback position, that promise. Uh, prayer altars all over departments. Not only you need to pray, inspire all others too. Uh, I was in a, one of the you know organizations and uh, I, I was talking to the Christians there and they said, no, our boss doesn't even want to identify uh, himself or herself with the with us Christians. And the, you know, we, we know born again, but we don't understand. We, we pray, we meet to pray. But for him, no, he's not interested. He, he knows, he, he always sends a message, I support you, but he just wants to be, to appear that, you know, he's for everybody. I said, what? He said, yeah, this is a Christian who can't even identify and say, we need to meet together and pray. It doesn't, you know, what, what is wrong for us to meet as a Christian and say, we need to meet and pray for God. You can have other people come in and pray, but you as a leader, have to show 
that your trust is in the Lord. You must not be ashamed of God. You must be bold enough to tell your people we believe in God. Everybody in this country knows Alan Kajina is born again. And that gives glory to God. And then the, the reason to glorify God that born again people can deliver. But you're bringing glory to the name of the Lord when you openly, I Mama Janet clearly says, I'm born again and I'm doing this because of God and I trust God and never be ashamed of God. Give glory to God. Daniel made clear his stand. He opened his windows, looked to Jerusalem to pray every day, morning, lunch, and evening. So he made it clear. That's how these people said, unless you are fighting him on something to do with this God, you'll never defeat him. They knew they are fighting God and Daniel's God. And let me tell you, the moment they do that to start openly fighting your God, God now will come in. But if you are not showing where you are, then how do you give God the opportunity to fight for you or to bring glory to his name? It's not about you. It's about him. And that is the key thing. Then another point she brought out was every interview covered by prayer. Every interview covered by prayer. This is a very important thing because the people we recruit are important. They are, are they right? Are they God, the, the right people God has called? God gave Moses an assignment and it was detailed. But he said, I have anointed Bezalel and Aholiab. They are the ones who will do this work. So it means if you get the wrong people, you will not accomplish your work. However committed you are, however dedicated to the cause you are, those people can cause you to fail if you do not pick the right people. That's why prayer in every interview is important. No wonder then you are able to deliver when you get the right people. But if you get the wrong people, it will be so difficult for you. It's a process that we need to take. And when you do that, God now honors that and says, okay, so you trust me to bring the right people, I'll bring them. Now, the, the final point, number six, is your leadership flows from the life of Christ within you. It's not for some people, the, 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 the interpretation is I need, I, I, what I need are the skills, the education, the papers, the, you may have all those things. You may have the right degree, you may have the uh, you know, PhD, uh, the skills, what, that is wonderful. And God is not against it. But if you do not have him and your, his life is not flowing out of you, you will not deliver. One of the issues, the resistance against uh, Alan's appointment there was that she wasn't uh, uh, trained in, in taxation. Her training was in, in, in something else. I think her degree was in psychology. And they said, how can you bring a psychologist here? You know, you, she's not, she didn't study taxation, uh, accounting, audit. No, none of those things. You can see that the world looks at these things differently because her life was uh, flowing with the Lord. The Lord was flowing through her life. That well, that, that uh, appointment came and God gave her grace. What is grace? When we were looking at covenant in the beginning of this uh, last few weeks, we looked at the uh, uh, definition of grace. Definition, the first definition is God's unmerited favor. The second definition is uh, divine enablement. When God enables you to do what you are not trained to, 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 to trained for, you don't have it by birth, you don't have it by training. You don't have it by experience. You have the fourth compensating factor, which is the grace of God. So the grace of God shows up when the life of Christ is flowing through you, when you are intimate with him, when you have maintained closeness with him, the grace of God will come. That is the divine enablement to enable you to do what you are not trained for, to give you the resources, human and, the, uh, and, and spiritual resources at your disposal to achieve and, and, and the, uh, fulfill your assignment. Now, the last point was about timing to leave. When you go beyond your timing, the grace of God will not be there. If God wants you to go up to this level and you continue, you are, continue, he's supposed, you are supposed to turn to Massacre Road and you just continue to Mithiana Road. There is no grace for you. The, the grace of God may leave uh, uh, when you are still continuing. So I thought, thought that was also important to learn and to be sensitive when the Lord is saying it's time to leave. 
And before that comes, God wants us to train and the, the biblical word is disciple. This discipling is the biblical word for any office where you are, where you have to train your staff, where you have to pour into their lives, where you have to empower them and release them. That is the biblical word. The biblical word is discipling. God expects us to disciple and then send out. And when people who have been trained under you go and start to accomplish what you have been accomplishing here, heaven calls that you have discipled. So you have fulfilled the great commission. Go therefore and make disciples. So God starts to honor you because you are pouring whatever he has given you into others. If you are selfish and you are just saying, I will not show them lest they take my position, you are being selfish. And God will not promote you. Promotion comes when you start to pour out to others and then you release them and then you leave a legacy. Finally, transformation will never take place unless you, whom God has called, will bring his power in the various positions or organizations or institutions where God has deployed you. Now let's use a few minutes to uh, for, for Alan's comment or any question so that we maximize this testimony for uh, any of us who would like to comment or ask questions. Just put up your hand, I'll see it here and then we'll respond. And in case uh, uh, Sister Allen, you have anything to, to add or any of the questions that will be asked, please be uh, willing and ready to, 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 to answer those questions. Quickly, because we, have, uh, we don't have much time, if you have any questions, please put up your hand. I will see it here and then I will, uh, I will pick you and then we, we continue. I will have a few minutes for announcement and then we'll end. Okay, I have Mark Langa. Uh, please go ahead, Mark Langa. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the presentation. Mine is a very simple question. Um, and I think uh, many will identify with it. Um, what was your most discouraging moment in, in, this whole, in this whole time? Thank you very much. Okay, any other question? Any other question so that uh, Alan will answer them together? If there's any other question, uh, we can ask them. And then when she comes, then she will answer them together. Any other question? Mark, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Mugumia. Unmute, Elizabeth. Yeah, I had a question about uh, fuel, the training program that Alan spoke about. Hmm. Is that uh, program available um, to other people? Can we uh, access it and how, how can we access that? Okay, thank you. Patrick Sechigongo and then Mary Odu, Oduko Chan. Be brief and yeah, to the... hmm. uh, my focus on number one don't allow things to go wrong when you are watching. Uh, I wanted to, to get plans, but sometimes you get the either juniors or seniors, and uh, you find that though you love things want to go wrong, but somewhere, somehow, your hands are tight. Uh, how did Ellen handle that? Juniors and seniors, thank you. Okay, Mary Odu, Oduka Ochan. Thank you, Bishop. Praise God. Um, mine is to do with um, the prayer team that um, Alan established. And um, they, you know, they were coming and praying together. Were there times when she needed to have a smaller group within that prayer team when there were other sensitive information possibly that you may not be able to share very widely, depending on you know, the type of people you have around you. Okay, I, I, don't, did I, I don't know whether I got it right, um, but I think Alan got, got it. Joy Ankunda, you are the last one. Yeah, thank you so much, Alan. Um, the testimony is very inspiring. I wonder whether you really uh, plan to write it because we, lead, we read so many leadership books and uh, they inspire us. 
I feel uh, if this can be put in a book and we buy it and it pass through, uh, it goes many generations read it, it will really change the body of Christ and will have influence and transformation. Thank you, Joy. Uh, Sister Allen, uh, could you please uh, use those uh, five minutes to respond to these, uh, some of these questions? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Bishop Joshua. Uh, I think your recap was even more powerful than yesterday. <laughs> you always <laughs> do such a great job. <laughs> and, and thank you, everybody, for your very kind comments and the questions you've raised. And, and, and let me say that um, for all these questions you've asked, <laughs> there is an answer. I only shared an experience. Some of these things really, I, I tell you, they even surprised me as they happened because uh, you can't tell you're on the path until you've looked behind and, and, and seen the journey you have covered. Uh, you, you can't often tell how complicated and how some of these things you overcame them. But that's what testimony is all about. Were there discouraging moments? Was there a particular one? Gosh, there were so, so many. And, and each one of them uh, was actually a battle. That's why Bishop Joshua was saying, you know, I was constantly calling him and calling other Christians and we were praying because those moments were times when you'd hit a wall. Uh, some of them were technical, they related to the work that we're doing. Some of them aligned and uh, lied against, even publicly. Some of them were when, um, you know, even the prayer team would be so badly hit that you'd find yourself like two or three left uh, at the altar. So, um, Mark, the, the, I, I really cannot pick out one. I think on this journey, there are many. But the important thing is to know that the, a valley exists because there are two mountains, you know? So you're not always going to be in the valley. We're never always in the valley. The valley is always there. A valley is created by two mountains. So you have more mountain times than valley times if you will keep your mind, you know, your eyes focused above. Uh, the, the program Fuel, um, I had not really considered making it available because I didn't consider it as mine. Uh, when it was initially developed in, in URA, the, all the materials were paid by URA. By the way, I, didn't, I never did charge and I've never charged for it even the times that have trained on it because uh, I felt like I, I couldn't do it. But their materials, they are, they, 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 that had to be made, their CDs, their books, their, there were trips to uh, up country. We invited uh, eminent persons from even out of the country to participate with us. So I will ask for permission from URA and from UDRA who has done this also, uh, if they can allow me to, you know, to, to, to train uh, using their material. Um, don't allow things to go wrong. I didn't quite get that question very well, but I seem to hear, what I seem to, heard, what, to have heard was that uh, sometimes you're not in position to do anything about it. Uh, things are going wrong and, and you, you're, you're handicapped. Um, yes and no. Okay, first of all, you will always have the option of praying. That, that one, nobody can stop you. Not, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't stop Daniel. <laughs> so no one can stop you from praying. Um, the, and that's the most powerful. But secondly, your voice matters a lot. And sometimes in not allowing things to go wrong, you, you are exposing yourself to great risks. You could be sacked. You could um, lose your, yeah, you could be harmed. So you count the cost and, and say, should I keep quiet and allow the road to continue? Or should I speak out and give the institution an opportunity to heal? And uh, for me, really, I uh, felt like I must confront these situations because if I don't, I'm going to account to God and, and, tell, and have to explain to him why I saw things going wrong and I chose to preserve myself. So these were uncomfortable moments. Uh, and 
unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes these are forced on you by your supervisor. So I, I did confront, with, confront my supervisor. Um, there was one particular one which was so hard because my supervisor who was the commissioner general at that time was tearing the institution apart, tearing management apart, throwing people in prison, uh, brought investigators from outside who were complaining. And I, I confronted her. I, I went to her office and I said, look, this is wrong. You're, you're tearing management apart. And, and it's going through the institution and if we don't bring the organization, if if because management was at uh, at loggerheads with each other because of the discord that was sown and it's by the commissioner general herself. Um, so I thought, okay, they, it's a very there's a very strong like likelihood that I will have no job by the end of the day, but I'm not going to sit back and do nothing about it. Let at least be recorded that I put up a fight. Yeah. So. Please don't keep quiet because evil will thrive when you keep quiet. Um, then uh, prayer team, yes, um, was there a time where I picked particular ones, uh, sm a smaller team. The team that uh, we prayed with every, every week at Jubilee Dental was this smaller team. There was a much larger Christian fellowship in, U in U URA. Um, but there are things you can, and you cannot, one, you cannot share in a larger group. Two, uh, there are people whose hearts are not prepared to deal with those issues. And when you bring them in, you, you have a mixed multitude. And uh, it can be very discouraging, but it can also be an interest for the enemy to actually cause much more confusion. Some information is so sensitive when you are praying about it you had all better be of one mind. So yeah, that was really the smaller group. Um, am I going to write a book? Okay, uh, I have struggled with this. Uh, and I have to say it's not because uh, it's a spiritual thing. I think it's a really a personal weakness. I've struggled with, with trying not to <laughs> write something that becomes a monument to Alan Kajina. Because sincerely, this is the work of God. This has always and will always be the work of God. And I have, I think, seen people write books and they have become um, something that elevates individuals rather than elevate God. Um, so I have prayed about it. Uh, I've been asked several times to write something about it. And let's say I, I have finally started. This is after so many years. Uh, uh, I'll bid reluctantly, but I also know that I owe, uh, I, I owe fellow believers here a testimony uh, of what God has done and God will do with them and through them. Uh, and so, yeah, I have begun to put something down. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you so much. Uh, Sister Ellen, there's a comment here too. I want to read very quickly. The, the person asked me not to disclose her name, but it's a good one. Uh, she said, Ellen forgot that her exemplary living would help her emphasize some godly values, starting with her priestly team. One time she took us to Entebbe and I remember she cautioned us to ensure we are compliant with paying taxes, even if we have small businesses before we can start enforcing compliance. She's one of those VIPs that pay her taxes well. And then she ended, please do not disclose my name. So I'm not going to disclose her name. Uh, thank you for other comments, uh, a number of them, but uh, uh, we, we want to thank you so much, uh, uh, Sister Allen. We will trust that others, uh, many of you or who are here on this altar will borrow a leaf, will take some lesson, key lessons from what we, she has shared. I request that if you can listen or, uh, to this testimony again and again, because really God, the way God works is that he, he gives us his word, but that word puts on flesh. When Jesus came, it was the word of God that came. But that word put on flesh. If the word doesn't put on flesh, it's very difficult for us to identify with it. 
So what these testimonies help us to identify where do I need help? Where am I, what is it that I'm not doing right? Where am I failing? And I pray that prayerfully, if you will do this, God will help you to identify some areas in your life. Very quick, quickly, four announcements. Our usual morning prayer uh, from uh, five to seven will continue until Saturday, this Saturday. Uh, even Saturday morning, we'll have uh, this uh, prayer. But after that, we will, uh, on Saturday, uh, every Saturday, 6 to 7, we will, I will continue with this altar. It will not be daily. Our lockdown, we are hoping or thinking that maybe it will be done by the end of this week. We don't know what will happen. But for now, we have agreed that at least, or we have had uh, uh, requests that would continue at least once a week from six to seven. But for tomorrow we'll have it. And then Saturday we will have it uh, in the morning, but then we will uh, have our Holy Communion at uh, 2 p.m. between two and, uh, and, and 4 p.m. We'll uh, break the fast together. And Mama Janet, the first lady, Janet will be joining us uh, at that time wants to have her communion with us and share with us. She knows what we are doing and heard about the, this prayer and what we are, how we are praying for the nation and the different leaders. And she wants to share some burden uh, on the national level. And, and, and I think it's important for us to listen to her uh, because of the position she really occupies. And we, we really want to, if you really can spare that time between two to four, I trust that all of us here today, we are 100 and what, we've been 156. If we can all be around at that time on Saturday, 2 to 4 p.m., even if you're traveling, these days, uh, uh, internet makes it easy. Let's join together at that time. That day, we'll have the 5 to 7 um, early morning water. Then at 11 to noon, we'll have a general national one, but that one is optional for you to join. We are praying together and joining with other leaders all over the country. Our brother Apostle John Bunjo is mobilizing that a national prayer uh, right now so that we have one hour of praying together. But then at two, we will have a break. That is noon, uh, from noon to two. You have a free time in case you have joined all these three. Then we'll have uh, uh, that uh, breaking of our fast and Holy Communion from two to four. Tomorrow, uh, our sister Faith Katana and the, 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 the presidency uh, group will be leading us, uh, will lead us in prayer, will share with us, will give them enough time, uh, being the topmost office in this country. We are looking forward to, to see how we, what they will be sharing and how they will guide us in how we can effectively pray for, for, for the presidency. It is a requirement in the Bible. Uh, in First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, God tells us to pray for all those who are in leadership so that there may be peace in the nation. We are sorry for the, uh, those five minutes that have gone beyond our usual time, but at least uh, we, we, I'm sure that we, we've really been blessed. Thank you, Pastor, uh, our sister, Allen. Thank you, Paul. Paul, I'm sure Paul is around. Paul, we, we know you've been working behind the scenes. You're part of this uh, testimony and we want to really, really thank God so much for what your life has been for the, the level of, of uh, support that you've given to Allen, whatever she accomplishes here uh, and what she accomplished in your area, we know you're part of it. And we want to pray for you as a couple now. We just want to end with that prayer and bless you because you've been a great blessing to us. Father, we thank you for Paul and Allen. Thank you for their life. Thank you for what they have accomplished together as husband and wife, and what Paul has done to pray to support uh, Allen to do what she did. Because had he not supported her, Lord, she would not have accomplished that. So we really need, we want to acknowledge his uh, uh, contribution in this and the support and the prayer and the spiritual covering that he has provided. We thank you for their family. We thank you for their children. We thank you for that testimony will continue to bear fruit. We also thank you for the disciples that Allen has raised during her tenure of office 
that they have gone out and we have seen many of them going and uh, performing. And we know even those who are still under her now in UNRWA are going out now are going to, to become great women and great men. And we look forward that she, this discipleship program, which is part of the Great Commission, Lord, is taking place in her life uh, because you're flowing through her. She has allowed herself to be used of you, uh, not only to perform, but also to train others. Thank you. Continue to use her in the remaining time of her tenure of office in, in this country to raise up more leaders like, uh, like her or greater than her. We thank you and we bless you for them. Continue to give them the peace. And all of you now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. We meet tomorrow at, first, at 5 a.m. as usual in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much.